The first artist we're going to talk about is Rosa Bonheur. She is a French animal painter. She is very much involved with the art movement known as realism in the sense of the, her style is extremely realistic. Uh, and here we have a portrait of her uh, painted by um, uh, one of her students uh, who at the end of her life became her companion. So we have the portrait of Rosa Bonheur. As an animal painter, what Rosa Bonheur does is take the techniques that um, a, a male artist may use to learn human anatomy and apply them to animals. So she's not just looking at the outer being of the animal. Um, she is studying anatomy. She is observing the animals uh, in nature or in their you know, habitat, as it were. Uh, of course, a lot of them are domestic animals, so you, she might go to a horse fair. Uh, or, you know, uh, she dissects bodies. She goes to butcher shops and, uh, and studies the, the anatomy of the animals. So she really, really knows this. And it shows up in her work. She does have an unconventional upbringing. And so her mother dies when Rosa is about 11 years old. Her father is an artist, a minor artist. And he's a me um, member of uh, the group called the St. Simeons, uh, which is a radical group, a progressive social group, and among the many other things that uh, they do, they do promote women's equality and even the idea of androgynous clothing. So this is probably where Rosa Bonheur, in a sense, gets her start, just the idea that she could have this kind of career, uh, and uh, uh, sort of uh, realizing that it's possible for a woman to wear something besides skirts when it's practical. Uh, she is a very unconventional person. She wears trousers when she goes to the stockyards and the, probably the butcher shops and the horse fairs and wherever she is um, going to see the animals. Just mucking around in the, <laughs> in the dirt. Uh, it's n not very practical when you're wearing very long skirts and uh, they're trailing in the muck and uh, you've got petticoats on and you're weighed down by that. Um, now, she had to get permission from the police. She had a permit that allowed her to wear trousers. Otherwise, she could have been, uh, I guess, arrested. Um, she did remain unmarried her entire life. Uh, and you'll find that this happens sometimes with women um, who want a career. Uh, I know that that was always one of the, the questions. That, you know, if, you, if you are married, uh, should you be allowed to work? Um, it, I remember the first one, I had a job briefly in a public school system. And when I got pregnant, um, I was fired. And I remember somebody said to me, well, you're lucky that they let you work when you were married. Because uh, in uh, a few, some decades earlier, uh, if a school teacher got married, she would lose her job. So um, some women made that choice to dedicate themselves to their career. And you'll see that some men, women get married and some don't, and uh, they make different life decisions. Um, she did quite well. <laughs> she got, made lots of money. She eventually was totally was, was independent, and she was able to purchase an estate. Uh, she did some uh, things that were quite radical, like bobbing her hair, cutting her hair shorter, uh, and smoking cigarettes. Uh, I guess they didn't know how bad that was for you back then. Um, here's another uh, portrait of her uh, with her arms around a bull or an ox or some kind of bovine anyway. Um, and one of the things, one of her strategies, <laughs> uh, because of course the press was interested in her and uh, she had to present herself in a certain way, uh, she maintained femininity in her interviews, in her photographs. She did not allow herself to be photographed in her trousers. And when she presented herself in the public, she would always wear a dress. You see her wearing a dress in her, in her uh, portraits and photographs and, and uh, everything that's, that's done for her. I said photographs. I guess they're all paintings. Um, she asserts that the trousers are a working costume that is necessary for the type of work that she does. And it's not her normal, regular garment. Um, it, politically, she's conservative. She's a monarchist. Um, but she does seem to want some freedoms for herself that most women did not have. 
and she's able to do that because of her success at uh, her type of art. Uh, I don't have a picture of her first salon uh, painting. Uh, this one has sheep in it. It's a much later picture, as you can see, but I just, so I just put it in for the illustration. But in 1841, she exhibited in the salon, and uh, it said that this was two charming groups of a goat, sheep, and rabbits, or animals. Um, the salon, as I think we've said this before, the salon is the annual exhibition of the Royal Academy when it's royal, and the French Academy when it's not royal, but it's the, the, uh, it's the, uh, the salon is the official uh, exhibition of the French Academy. And almost every year, unless there is some political unrest or uh, an invasion of the Prussians, which happens later, um, that they can't put on an exhibition, but virtually every year they have a juried show and to be recognized as a professional artist in um, France, you really had to be uh, juried into that show. So she is. Her work is accepted into the salon. Her, one of her first great successes was this painting, uh, Plowing in Nervenay. And you can see the oxen uh, pulling, pulling the plow. Uh, this uh, was created in 1848, and it won a gold medal in the 1849 salon when it was, uh, when it was um, displayed. And it was even purchased by the government to hang in the Louvre. One of the critics says something uh, very interesting. Mademoiselle Rosa paints almost like a man. And you will find that that is a motif that goes through um, the history of art. Uh, when someone wants to praise a woman artist, they say, she paints like a man. Uh, I don't know if they get, well, they do. They, the underlying assumption is a woman's art would be inferior. So if she's a good artist, she's an exception. She's painting like a man. Weaker art is a woman's art, but you know. uh, here we see some of the details. And this is you know, extremely realistic, as you can see. Uh, she really does understand the anatomy. Uh, and she goes through, of course, many, many drawings. Uh, and yet there's that feeling of life. It's the feeling of the animals uh, hard at work uh, in nature. They often say that this shows the nobility of laboring animals, which is an interesting word to use. Uh, the idea that there is nobility in work, uh, which is almost a contradiction in terms since the tra traditionally nobles don't do much work. Uh, but there is something honorable about the animals who are uh, helping us create the food that we will be eating. Uh, they're you know, hard, hard at work just like the people, even more so. There are some influences on this. I have not been able to find a reproduction of this drawing uh, in George Sand's uh, novel, The Devil's Pool. Um, and so, and I haven't read the book, so I, there are some influences. Um, I have not found uh, a reproduction of this, but uh, it's mentioned a drawing in George Sand's book, The Devil's Pool. And right there, I might mention that uh, uh, several women novelists uh, took male names, non de plumes, uh, in order to publish. Because if they were coming out with a female name for the author, the book would not be accepted for publication uh, and probably uh, would not be purchased. Um, another example is the 17th century cattle painter Paulus. Uh, Potter, and also she is part of this rural tradition of the uh, realist artists such as Corbet and Malay, where they go out and they paint nature, and Malay particularly paints people working in nature. Uh, so here we see uh, the plowing in Nervenay and uh, the 17th century uh, example, which is uh, basically the cows uh, uh, standing, or in one case reclining, uh, kneeling, I guess, whatever, in the landscape. Um, in the case of Bon Hur, they are actually at work, and you have that feeling of uh, movement, 
uh, and labor. Uh, and I tried to find a picture of a corbet uh, where you're, you see nature. Uh, it shows a lot of these wooded scenes. Uh, now, another one of her very, very famous paintings, uh, probably the most famous one of all after it was created, was the Horse Fair. And this was created in 1855. Um, as we'll see, there's two versions of it. Uh, it had international fame in both England and the United States, where uh, it's interesting, Rosa Bonheur is French, but she has tremendous fame in England and also with this work in the United States. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but one thing is the English do seem to love their animals or be very, very interested in them. And so animal painters did very, very well in England. And uh, I go out on limb and say she's the best of them all. There's a detail of the horse fair. As you can see, you have the horses in action. Um, so they're, you know, they're running all of these horses around, uh, presumably, so people can choose what, which horses they want to buy. There are two versions. Um, I don't think from reproduction you can really tell which is which, uh, but the size is very different. The original one was nearly 16 feet long, which is huge. Uh, and it is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York today. Um, the other one is about a quarter of the size of that, so about four feet, and it's now in the National Gallery in London. Uh, it was very, very popular. Uh, there were engravings made of it, so even people who hadn't seen the painting would, would you know, know the composition, uh, would probably buy a copy for themselves, or hang it on their wall or whatever. Now, one of the things about making these very large uh, animal paintings uh, is that, and the realist artist did this. Uh, Courbet, for example, uh, painted a nine foot long picture uh, of the funeral of his grandfather. And that was just not done. If you were going to use a huge size, you were supposed to have uh, it be some kind of classical, mythological, or religious, or allegorical subject, what they called history painting. Remember, history painting with Angelica Kaufman. So um, history painting was supposed to be big, and uh, the pictures of animals and uh, genre pictures of ordinary people and things, they were supposed to be smaller. So what is Rosa Bonheur doing when she does a 16-foot picture of this? She is claiming the importance of an animal picture, that it's just as important as a picture of Hercules or Zeus or the Madonna and Child or something like that, or something in ancient Roman history. So, um, you know, this, you know, this is something that uh, is a um, innovation in a sense, and it's obviously a successful one. Uh, you can see the animals uh, in movement, in action. So we have that grand scale as though it were a history painting. We have dramatic action. We have the knowledge that her anatomical studies bring. Uh, this isn't just somebody who's uh, looking at the outward uh, appearance of the horses. She really knows how uh, the bones and the muscles work. And uh, she's done very, very close observation of the animals in life. I mean, she's going to places like these horse fairs uh, and creating her work of art. Now, you have to realize, I know tonight we often think about people just going and, and sort of painting from life. I, I'm definitely should be doing sketches and putting these together in a studio. Uh, they are, as we've said before, very realistic images uh, at the time when uh, you know, realism was in vogue. It took 18 months worth, numerous life studies, and once again, she received uh, an award, she received a first class medal at the Salon. So her work was recognized. She was also supposed to receive the Cross of the Legion of Valor. But then I said, woman can't have that. So although she was supposed to receive it, she was denied it. However, uh, some years later, uh, almost nine years later, uh, in 1864, it was awarded, and the Empress Eugenie delivered the award herself uh, to Bonheur's studio. She was the first woman to receive the Cross of the Legion of Valor. Uh, another first, 
1894, she became an officer of the Legion of Honor, and she's the first woman to receive this honor. So these are national honors that are given to prominent people uh, who have done outstanding things in, in uh, different fields. And uh, generally, they're not given to women. So you know, she, they really had, she really had to excel in the quality of her work and have it recognized. Um, this is called Highland Raid, or sometimes it's called a Scottish Raid. I've seen it called both things, uh, dating from 1860. And uh, I was able to take some details of it. Uh, it's in the National Museum of Women in the Arts in uh, Washington, D.C. Although it's not, it's not listed on their website, so it may be that it was on loan or something when I saw it. But uh, at, any rate, um, at any rate, I do have some details of it. Um, Bone Hur did go to Scotland. And in 1855, she went to Scotland uh, to meet Queen Victoria, who loved animal pictures. And she did a number of sketches. And some of these sketches became paintings with Scottish themes uh, that we see uh, throughout the uh, later part of her life. Um, the Highland Raid, it's been pointed out, is kind of anachronistic. Uh, that uh, the, the Scots were not doing cattle raids in the 1860s or the 1850s. Uh, this was something that had been from a, uh, about 100 years before, perhaps, or before that. Uh, but it gives her a wonderful opportunity to show uh, all of these different types of herding animals. You've got your uh, goats and your, uh, your very furry uh, Highland cattle, um, just um, in really a kind of um, emotional quality to about them. Uh, you have, the, of course, always the excellent study of anatomy, the textures of the paint, and the different textures of the different fur of the animals, the different hair of the animals. Very close observation. Uh, and I thought it was interesting because we really do sense the unrest and the emotion of the animals when uh, those raiders who are in the dark in the background, you, you know, see them sort of silhouetted, are you know, swooping down on the herd. One of the things about Bon Hur's uh, animal paintings, and that's why I said they just, I, they, they are the best, you know. Uh, that's an opinion, but uh, they're certainly excellent. Uh, none of them seem to be very sentimental, and she doesn't usually make the animals anthropomorphic. Uh, in other words, the emotions they're feeling are what she would have observed in animals. Um, and let me give you another example. This is uh, a male artist, a uh, little bit older than she is, uh, in England. He's the most popular 19th century British animal painter named Edwin Lancier. Uh, he's particularly known for painting dogs, uh, and that's, uh, much, that's not the big part of uh, Bon Hur's um, au revoir, her body of work. Um, but I can show you what I mean when I say anthropomorphic and uh, uh, perhaps sentimental. Um, the picture at the top is actually it's a satire or a spoof. Uh, it's, it's intended to be humorous. It was became very, very popular, the laying down the law, in which the poodle is the judge. Uh, and so you have this kind of anthropomorphic uh, satire of a law court, uh, and uh, supposedly of some actual people. <laughs> uh, Bonhart doesn't do something like that. Uh, her animals are animals. Uh, and then, you know, this very lovely picture that I have here just called Saved. And you have the, the big dog that has uh, obviously dived into the water and brought out the little girl. Um, until I read the title of it, I thought she was dead and that he was, you know, trying to protect her. Uh, but uh, she saved her from drowning, evidently. And he, you know, he, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture, really. Um, many people would say, oh, it's just too sentimental. So I will say it's, it shows sentiment. In other words, it does show the proper emotion in a proper uh, British, or anybody else, but a British gentleman of the 19th century would want to show the proper sentiment. Uh, it's only in the 20th century that we call such things sentimental. But Bonhoeur never does that. Um, you know, her animals are, like I say, really anatomically correct, and they behave like animals, and they are animals in, um, their own their own world. Um, they may be you know animals that are being sold as in the horse fair or animals that are being raided as in the uh, um, 
Highland Raid, but they are uh, in the natural habitat, as it were. When I say natural, I'm including you know things that man has imposed on the animal. Um, I did find a picture of a Lanseer uh, uh, cattle picture and uh, the wild cattle of Chillingham. Uh, it dates about seven years after Bonheur's cattle raid, and I thought it was really interesting to me because the composition of it is almost a reverse of her, uh, it really is so close to the detail that I had taken of the cattle raid. Uh, the, the bull is turning his head in a very similar manner. Uh, the cow's head is coming in, and uh, of course, little calf is in the position where you have those uh, goats or sheep. Um, so I, I don't know if there was an influence there, which it would be from Lancier, uh, from Bone Her would be influencing Lancier if there were. Uh, we're looking at another one of these pictures that may have been inspired by her uh, Scottish sojourn, uh, and in this case, it's about ten years after the Scottish sojourn. Uh, sheep by the sea. And this is a very small picture. Uh, the Highland Raid is a very large picture. Uh, this is a very small picture, so she did all different scales, you know, appeal to different buyers. Uh, and so we have the Scottish theme of the, the sheep uh, out uh, on uh, the coast uh, with very thick textured paint, which relates to the very thick wool of the sheep. Uh, this was actually commissioned by the Empress Eugenie of France. Uh, and it shows, as we said, the animals in nature, uh, you know, calm, you know, doing what animals do. 